There's a million opportunities you guys will have as entrepreneurs. There's a million opportunities you'll have as business owners that can lead you to heaps of money. However, not all of them are the right opportunity. Not all of them are the thing that's going to get you what you really want out of your business. And that is a huge threat that we need to always, always, always be aware of. Hello, Profit First entrepreneurs and thought leaders. I am so excited today because we are going to talk about a really interesting topic and a topic that, you know, I get a lot, you know, a topic about scaling. And I am so excited because we actually have Joe DiMaria with us today. And Joe is a serial entrepreneur, but a serial entrepreneur on a major level. Okay. Like companies that he's grown to like over $50 million in sales. Um, he is also the founder of Teach to Scale. And what Joe does is, is he specializes in growing companies from that $1 million mark or $5 million mark to above that. So really exciting conversation today. And specifically, what we're going to talk about is really that difference between growing and scaling, right? Growing and scaling and what that is and what that means for you in terms of defining success. So please join me in welcoming Joe to our platform. Hey, Joe, how are you doing today? I am excellent. Thank you for having me. I've been excited to chat with you. Well, we're excited to chat with you too today. And, you know, this is one of the biggest questions that I get with entrepreneurs that feel like they're stuck on that, that merry-go-round, you know, when they like, they keep coming back to that same spot that looks like they've been there before deja vu. Yeah. And tell me about that first. Tell me about this growth and scaling and tell me about, you know, what is that difference and how did you even find that this problem was actually happening? That's an awesome question. Um, you know, the, the thing that I found in, in working with tons of entrepreneurs, corporations, things like that over the past, let's say, 10 years or so is when it really came into focus. The vast majority of the people I bump into, they get stuck between one and five million. And the reason is you can get to one million on sweat equity as a solopreneur, but then the game has to start changing, right? What, what gets you out of Egypt doesn't get you to the promised land. So you need to start dynamically shifting kind of what the model is. And a lot of the time when we look at, let's say we're stuck at 1.5 million for two or three years, you might have years where like way beyond it. And you think this is it. This is my breakthrough moment. I finally done it. And then you regress back to the mean the following year. And you have that fall from grace. You become very disillusioned with your business. You start to maybe resent your business. You start to blame your staff or your employees or Maybe you blame yourself and you start to lose trust and faith in the person that built it to a million in the first place or a million five or whatever. So in talking to all these entrepreneurs and in working with, with heaps of them over the past 10 years or so, the big thing that I always found is routinely the people that get stuck between one and five million are people that focus on monetization as the way that they're going to get out of there. They're just growth, growth, growth people. Um, you know, they're all about their dashboards, their metrics, they're this, they're that. But what they're doing is they're playing a game that I think is honestly kind of a zero sum game because I think growth is dangerous. And this is something that I talk about all the time. And when I sit down with a lot of entrepreneurs for the first time, if I say growth is dangerous, they're going to look at me like I'm crazy. But the reality is you can grow yourself to death. It's not hard to grow yourself to death. Almost any company can make more money. Money is just a tool. So there's, I, there's heaps of ways to add more revenue to a bottom line um, in any business. But functionally speaking, most businesses are not set up enough that if they could suddenly, I mean, everybody's chasing more leads, more sales calls, more conversions. Yeah, but if you actually suddenly doubled or trebled it, most of your companies would collapse. This used to happen all the time with, um, you know, in the early days of podcasting. If Tim Ferriss recommended a product, people would rush and buy out the entire supply. They'd ruin the supply chain and they would crater the company. They would get the hug of death, right? And it became a very famous thing with Tim Ferriss is the hug of death. It was almost terrifying to have him recommend you. Now, that's because growth is, is great. But growth is just a pursuit. You need the architecture to be successful. And that's the difference between scaling and growing. I always describe it as most entrepreneurs are looking for how do we get more leads in the machine, more sales? How do we get this page to convert better? I want to grow all these numbers on my dashboard. 
And we kind of collect these shiny objects and these pursuits that are, they're like buying ornaments every day of the year, but waking up on Christmas morning and realizing you never bought the tree, right? I mean, the, the tree is the architecture. It's what we're supposed to hang all this on. And if we never adjust that, if we never rebuild it, um, most often we're setting ourselves up for failure. And most entrepreneurs in one to $5 million range don't have a lead flow problem. They don't have a cash flow problem. They don't have a uh, conversion problem or a sales problem. They 100% have an architectural issue. And that will be the thing that catapults them forward. I love that. That is really, really interesting. They have a structural problem, right? Um, they've built a business like a Christmas time without a tree, right? They've got ornaments with no place to hang it. Um, tell me about, you know, that's interesting because, you know, very few companies even make it to seven figures, right? So it's not an easy feat to cross that boundary. Maybe, maybe hopefully it's getting easier with inflation when a dollar becomes less valuable, but, um, (laughs) you know, most of us, you know, it's quite a feat to get to that million. There's not many in your peer group once you get that. So when you talk about lack of structure, right. And, um, lack of really, you know, you've got the sales, you've got the great product or service that you're doing, you've got a brand, um, but not having internal structure. Tell me more. So what this structure really means. It's a great question. And I think a lot of people are going to hear me say that right now. And they're going to say, well, I don't have the sales. I don't have the lead flow. I don't have, you know, whatever. And I would tell you that those are symptoms of the problem, not the problem. A lot of the time, and you know, what I, when I talk about architecture in a company, I'm looking at for where you want to pilot the business, are you using the most appropriate model? Are you paying attention to your, your offer structures in a way that's going to set you up to be more cash flow positive? Are you overexposing yourself to risk by not paying attention to what you're supposed to be piloting the business towards? So this is one of the most fun things about what I do is there's loads of people stuck between that one to five. But I get just as many people that are at 10 or 15 million who wake up and they're in the business they never wanted to run. And it's because they chase the growth mindset and they follow every opportunity like a dog chasing a car. But they'll wake up one day and realize they've just built themselves a very pretty golden cage. And a lot of the time, fundamentally, the way you have to start looking at your business architecture is you need to go back and you need to truly understand what you are hiring the business to do for you. We, we think about, oh my gosh, what, what are my goals for the business 10 years from now, 25 years from now, five years from now, whatever it is. And we think, oh, I want 50 employees. Uh, I want to serve 100,000 people. I want to do this, that, and the other thing. But all of those are, they're, they're features of a system if you build it the right way. Like if you, if you, your business is just a machine, it doesn't have thoughts, it doesn't have feelings, it doesn't know what it's doing, it just outputs whatever you've designed it to, to create. Shoving more inputs into it, creating the wrong outputs is not the solution to most people's problems. Very often we need to look at the business system as a whole and we need to figure out what do we want this business to really achieve for us as the entrepreneur, or as the leader personally first. And then we can go back and we can make sure that our business model, that our structure, that our team, everything we put in place then empowers us to get there. Too many entrepreneurs don't pay attention to that at all. And they just chase growth, growth, growth. And they either never break through and they're frustrated and they resent the business. They get tired of it and they sell it and they go try to start a new business in a different industry and they have the same damn problem. And then they, they go nuts over it or they do break through. And honestly, I think it's worse to break through and find out that you've been chasing a mirage. It's worse to break through and hit 10 million, 15 million, get exactly where you thought you wanted to be and wake up and be miserable, to hate the business you've built, to dislike the clientele, to, to hate your lifestyle, to, to sacrifice you know, the things that mattered to you in the first place. And there are, you're right, not that many people that make it to a million, but I'll tell you, there's even fewer happy people that make it to 10. And this is an architectural issue. It goes all the way back to the foundational buildings of the business. I love that, Joe. So well, what Joe is saying, guys, is, you know, you got to start with why, right? Let's like Simon Sinek says, you got to start with the why. 
you know, what is the ultimate outcome that you want from your business? You know, do you want this business that constantly relies on you or you're the center of the wheel? And if you're not rolling, nobody else is rolling either. Or do you want a business that runs without you that gives you that location freedom um, to be able to go where you want to go and be who you want to be and have a company that runs without you? So it starts with defining, you know, really what does winning look for you? Um, Tell me what else goes into a successful system that allows us to scale. Well, this is where I think heaps of people have been led down the wrong path by the internet marketing era. Um, you know, almost everybody I talk to, they can build a, even services businesses, local businesses, et cetera, and they want to turn around and start creating courses or memberships or, or all this stuff that they're just seeing online. The reality is, and most people don't realize this, they don't think about it, but if you just look at basic percentages, very few entrepreneurs make it past 10 years, right? Now, the internet marketing era, you could say, really started in 2006, 2007. So let's look at a 12, 13-year trend. Most entrepreneurs around you have not been in business long enough to understand what the world was like before 2006. And they haven't been students of business and entrepreneurship prior to the internet marketing era. So everything they are doing is a fixation on a 10 to 15-year aberration in a 150-year trend line if you're looking at American entrepreneurship, right? So all of these people are hyper fixating on models that are less than 15 years old that haven't been practically proven in a longer term scale. And most of them, the people that are teaching you how to do them or the people that you're emulating have been doing them long enough that they had benefits you didn't have. When I was around at the beginning of the internet marketing era, it was very cheap to buy traffic. And so you could afford to have cheap programs, cheap products, cheap services, and you could sell to the masses, right? It was very much a a volume business because traffic was cheap. Well, the same lead that I might've gotten for two or three pennies in 2010 cost me anywhere between 85 and $250 now. Not scalable to do cheap anything. But a lot of the time, we're still emulating the people that are doing those things, but they've got the benefit of, you know, 50,000 to 100,000 people on a list and they've got 10 years of history, they've got all the systems in place, and you're coming in cold and trying to start your first business, and you're at a few hundred thousand thinking, yeah, this shiny object is the next thing for me. So it's this common mismatch between what we need our business to do and the way we're trying to get there. And a lot of the time, it's because most entrepreneurs do not start with the destination in mind, right? They just build, and we become agents of chaos in our own business. We break as much stuff as we build because we don't have a, a genuine North Star to follow all the time. And if you know that, you know, I'll give you a, a quick example. If, if you and I have the same exact company, same exact industry, we're both at a million dollars. But what you value is you don't want to manage a team. You would like to stay kind of in a non-leadership role, right? But you'd like to still grow the business. And if I don't want to be running it at all. And I want to empower my team to do it. And I want to retire with my wife and whatever next year or two years from now. Well, same business, same, we could have the same PLs. We could look at the ceteris paribus, all things being equal. If we both knew our North stars, we would automatically make very different decisions about where we're going. If we don't know those things, you might end up in a business where you're accidentally managing a dozen people and you're miserable. And I might end up in one where I'm taking on all this extra stuff and we're making more money, but I'm taking on more responsibility and it becomes impossible for me to extricate myself. So that North Star concept is so, so important because it really becomes a filtration mechanism for all the things you shouldn't be doing. And I guarantee you, any entrepreneur, there is millions, a myriad of things more that you should not be doing than things that you should be doing. And a lot of the time we're like greedy children in the, the kitchen, right? Trying to go after every single thing we see. And it, it leads to tons of honestly heartache in our businesses. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and I like what you said. That's a, a different way to think about it. You know, a lot of times these gurus or teachers out there, right? They're teaching what worked for them. And you're right. You know, the internet is rapidly evolving. You know, even Facebook ads that worked a year ago, they don't work now because of the iOS update and privacy laws and things like that. And, you know, I'm like $250 a lead. That's, you know, um, 
yeah, you know, you, you can't uh, you can't sell a um, ten dollar blanket or for for a two hundred and fifty dollar lead, right? Sure. Um, so you're absolutely right, especially when you don't have control of that targeting anymore. Um, that can be extremely difficult. And you know what worked last year doesn't work this year. And and so how do we flux in a world where you know you're obviously a, a serial entrepreneur, Joe, right? You you've had multiple businesses. You're acquiring businesses every single day. Um, how do you flux in a world where there isn't a book anymore that is a try and true way, or even like like you said, what you know, what worked for the gurus don't work anymore. We're learning by really experimenting right now, right? So how do you grow and scale in that environment? It's a good question. I I think for the most part, everything that I focus on is how would you build a company in 1965. Right. I mean, if, if you want to figure out what the the universals are, you need to go before the aberration started. Functionally speaking, you can go back to 1890, which is pretty much the birth of advertising as we know it. Um, and you can see that the most productive, successful, um, you know, m- like just conversion focused ads of all time, advertorials, um, articles, magazine articles, whatever it is. All of those were education focused. They're all focused on relationship. And if you can take a lot of that spirit and you can pay attention to 150 years of relationship being the thing that people sell, you know, trust, safety, helping others. And then you compare that to this 15 year aberration we're in. And what we sell is lifestyle, get rich quick. It's, it's oh, an, an easy business. It's millionaires overnight. It's Lamborghinis. It's, it's all these things that they are clearly the product of this small tranche of time. But if you just look outside of that window and you go study the guys like, you know, Eugene Schwartz, or you go and read Robert Collier, or you go read Claude Hopkins, or you go look at Ogilvy's uh, stuff in the 70s, you will see fundamentally how to create fantastic businesses. It's why I'm still a huge Jay Abraham fan, because I I think Jay's practical advice on building relationship-focused trusted advisor companies is exactly the way business of old used to be run. And you're seeing right now this big turnaround in ad spend over the past uh, two years, basically COVID, right? The big messages that worked on Facebook before COVID, get rich quick, Amazon FBA, you know, make money in your pajamas, laptop lifestyle, all this stuff, right? Membership sites, passive income. As soon as COVID hit, those ads didn't work anymore. It immediately went back to trust, safety, helping others. Think back to, if you watch TV, all of your insurance companies, all of your medical companies, all of the messaging that they were putting out wasn't, hey, buy our stuff. It's, hey, we're here for you. We care about you. You know, we're, we're all going through this together. Everybody switched to relationship messaging because suddenly the spell was broken, right? When, when the whole dynamic of the internet marketing consumer relationship changes overnight because commerce shuts down, all of a sudden people realize that they never really needed that. Or they suddenly put less import on driving the Lamborghini or having, you know, 20 women in bikinis follow you through a Whole Foods or whatever these guys are are doing in ads now. So my point in in all this is simply that when, when you want to build something in the modern day, you need to be going back to the time honored principles and adapting them for new technology, not creating new things. Right. There's nothing new under the sun. Some of my most successful ads and sales letters were basically shameless ripoffs of Gary Halbert. And I can tell you that most copywriters, most entrepreneurs, most marketers, we do exactly the same thing. We, that's why we, ha- we all have swipe files, which I'm sure you're well aware of. Right. So you don't need to be inventing. And I think so many of us feel like we have to invent our way out of our growth problem or our scaling problem, but we end up wasting thousands of hours trying to be good at something that we're just not attuned to. And we end up again, becoming resentful. We start to not enjoy being in our business. We start to not trust ourselves. And when you go down that path, you don't really get to come back from it, right? It becomes a very self-defeating cycle. That was some truth bombs. Oh my goodness. Some serious truth bombs, you know, about going back to the basics, you know, what does the market really need? Right. Um, You know, and, and, 
you know, the COVID era, people were lonely, right? We were isolated and we wanted to know we weren't out there as alone on the island as we're navigating this unknown. And so building that sense of security was really important and building that relationship and that trust was important for being able to, you know, really create that tribe that, you know, eventually becomes part of your your family, right? Your family system of clients, right? Mm-hmm. With that. Um, and and some amazing true bombs with that is, you know, just going back to the basics and then creating the how based upon the basics. How do we let you know that we care, right? Out yeah. there and figuring that out because that's the big thing is the end game is making sure that our clients care, our employees care, right? That we're scaling. Um, and we scale because if we scale, we, we create loyalty. You know, people stay with us longer as employees. They get better at their jobs when they're A players and we create a better company, right? And mm-hmm. same with customers, you know, they come to us because they know you care, right? People work with you because they know that you care. So amazing true bonds with that, Joe. Thank you. And, you know, I, I kind of can guess what you're going to answer when I ask you, where does it go wrong with scaling and growth? You know, I, I know we talked about, you know, it goes wrong when we create a machine and we don't go back to the why and we create a machine that really doesn't meet our needs. Um, Joe, where else can it go wrong? I'll tell you that once you are aware of where you're trying to pilot it and you understand that you're using the proper model to empower you to get to where you need to go, then it becomes paying attention to what are kind of our values? What are the things that we really care about in client service? How do we build authority and trust with our market? If you, I mean, you can do everything right. And if your market feels that you are totally out of alignment with them and that you have no idea what they need, you will fail. You can have the world's best widget, gadget, whatever, and it could be exactly what they need. But if it's not what they want, it is very difficult for you to create that connection. And there's quite a few startups that I've worked with that I've had to reposition you know, their, their product focus because it's a great thing in a vacuum. But it's not practical to put it in front of the audience they're trying to put it in front of. And again, that's because we decide what our product is, and then we try to shoehorn people into it. But there is such a huge mismatch. I mean, none of us would ever want that experience as clients or as customers. If I walk into, I don't know, I told you I'm in Las Vegas, I'm traveling, hence my substandard setup today. Um, But you know, we're going to, to Morimoto tomorrow night. And if I walked in, and I was just told what I was going to get, that would probably be a less optimal experience or a less exciting experience than somebody catering to me and figuring out what I really want or somebody understanding me well enough to get deeper into what it is I'm trying to do there, right? Because client experiences, being the trusted advisor, which should be all of your goals, no matter what you're doing, that takes a deeper level of intimacy. And a lot of the time, that means you need to do the work ahead. I am shocked and frankly appalled still to this day how few entrepreneurs really do market research before they launch a new product, launch a new campaign, start their business. And some of you you say, oh, I've been working with this group for, for 10 years, 20 years. I know exactly what they want. I will tell you that's BS. You might know 70%. You might know 80% and you will die in that 20% gap. If we build a bridge 80% of the way from you know, one island to another and you run down it enthusiastically, it's still not going to do anything for you. There's still a missed connection there. So market research becomes your most important tool. And I can go into literally every company I've ever touched and I can say, well, show me the research, what's the research process like? And it's either completely anecdotal or it didn't happen at all. So for you guys, if you want to break through and you want to get an advantage that your competitors certainly don't have, I know this because nobody does it, you need to be doing market research. And there's two requirements I would ask of you. It needs to be anonymous and it needs to be a place where they are within a community where they trust the people around them. So it has to be inherent intimacy. So how do you do that? You have to become the fly on the wall. You have to figure out where your target market is having conversations amongst their peers, right? Where there's no fox in the hen house, right? There's nobody soliciting. There's nobody putting them on guard. And they need to have anonymity. 
It can't be Facebook groups where someone's name and their whole life is attached to it because they're not going to be transparent about their problems. You need those two things together. If you can do that, you'll get an honest answer. But if you're interviewing your clients, if you're talking to your past prospects, or if you're just anecdotally picking things out of the ether that you want to focus on because it seems important to them, you are playing a game of Russian roulette. Your chances of hitting the sweet spot every time are literally zero, right? You can, anybody can play Russian roulette a certain number of times. And then all of a sudden, eventually your luck is going to run out, right? And for most of us, unfortunately, that's a very expensive lesson to learn. Oh yeah, guys, don't play Russian roulette, okay? Don't play <laughs> Russian roulette, whatever you do. Um, know your market, right? Know your market, you know, um, and in combination, you know, that knowing that market is going to set your strategy, just like Joe says, you know, if you're selling um, jewelry, right, and you're trying to do it on Facebook ads, and it's $250 per lead <laughs> on that Facebook ad, you know, you don't want to be selling those $5 bracelets, right? You got to know, you know, your, your customer, who your market is, who can buy that bracelet, right? So we can target those ads. Um, does anybody want that bracelet, you know, first mm-hmm. of all, right? And make sure you're in front of that right person that there is a um, possibility that you can scale. I know one of the things that we do when we go into a new market is, you know, we look at the um, number, of the population in that industry, right? Is there, is it a big enough industry that it's worth serving that niche, right? Um, you know, going on there and looking at those lists, those industry lists and going, you know, you know, those call lists, you know, is there enough prospects possibly out there that can possibly buy? So you got to make sure there's a market demand. There was so much goodness in in what Joe has shared with us today. Um, Joe, I want to think I want to talk to you about too, is as we close out and we wrap up today's session, if you can leave our, our viewers and listeners with one piece of advice, what would that advice be? And it can be personal or business. I think we kind of touched on it earlier, which is, you know, when I, when I started in Silicon Valley and when I started with my company, I wanted to be a billionaire. And then I met billionaires and they were miserable. And I wanted 200 million and I met people with 200 million and they were miserable. And I went back to my office and I said, okay, I want 50 million. And I met people with 50 million and they were miserable. And the reason without fail, all those people were miserable is they ended up getting swept away with their own business. They became victims of their own growth. These are peak performers. They're geniuses. They're incredible business people. That's not the issue. They can make money all day. A lot of you can make money all day. But the thing that became their downfall was their own success, their inability to take a step back and architect the business and drive it towards that North Star. Because there's a million opportunities you guys will have as entrepreneurs. There's a million opportunities you'll have as business owners that can lead you to heaps of money. However, not all of them are the right opportunity. Not all of them are the thing that's going to get you what you really want out of your business. And that is a huge threat that we need to always, always, always be aware of. So I would always go back to what is your North Star and really making sure that everything we do is extremely intentional so that we can empower ourselves to deliver, like let this business deliver us to the place we ultimately want to be in because it's a machine. All it knows how to do is deliver us where we program it to go. I love it. Exactly. Your business is only going to do what you <laughs> design it to do, right? Um, and so you've got, like like Joe says, you got to design a business that allows you to win, right? You got to design a business that allows you to live the life that allows you to feel like when you go home at night that you've absolutely won. So that is some beautiful advice um, because, you know, one of the things I always find with Profit First um, and you know, you guys know at Profit First, you know, there's, we call these target allocation percentages, right? We have a goal for a certain dollar amount at the end. And this, this dollar amount changes as our business grows, you know, but once you get to that, that million dollar mark, you know, that percentage changes more, you know, and it's interesting because once they get to those goals, right, those target allocation percentage, one of the things I always do with my clients before they even start, I have them document what does winning look like, right? And and we put this on a board, almost like a vision board, you know, for some of them as being debt free, some of us taking that four-week vacation, being able to go to Alaska, you know, and for four weeks and not have to worry about a client call. And and it's interesting because after a year when they've reached that target allocation percentage, you know, 
And we, we go back and we visit this board and we check things off. You know, I always ask them, are you happy now? And it's interesting because they're all happy and they're proud of where they've gone, but then they go, okay, I want to make it to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so it's always the next thing. That's how it always is. It is, it is, you know, and, and that's why it's so important to really stay grounded and what does winning look like? Because at the end of the day, winning is a moving target, right? And we have to appreciate mm-hmm. constantly where we were at and benchmark it to go, you know, to really appreciate that we're skewing away from what we really wanted. I 100% agree. Achievement oriented people are most often the most anxious, the most depressed, the most unhappy because they're always being driven to the next thing. They don't know how to appreciate the moment or how to celebrate, how to enjoy that. And it's very easy to get carried away by our own ambitions, our own desires, our dreams to stay present. And again, to understand that destination and know that day by day, you're moving towards that thing. That's the only way for us to have a really great relationship with our business. Oh, um, yeah. And, you know, that, that's a big thing that I, I really try to pound into entrepreneurs that are in maybe their first one or two years that aren't at the million dollar level yet, but are trying to go there. It's really building a good relationship with the business to empower yourself to get there. Because ultimately, again, it's just going to do what you build it to do. So if you're not thinking about those things from day one, you're setting yourself up to have to go and reinvent the business midstream. And the worst time to build a parachute is on the way down after you've jumped out of the plane, right? So it's, it would always be a little bit more optimal for all of our entrepreneurs to have this going in on day one to know exactly what they want the business to do. Oh, yeah. I remember like um, when I first started doing Profit First, we had a client and we took him and, and he was making profit between profit and an owner, uh, owner's pay of about maybe a hundred thousand, a little bit over a hundred thousand was what his take home was. And then after his first year, after employing profit first, he was probably around 600,000. And, and he was complaining, I, I still don't make any money. And I remember my staff accountant looked at me and she looked at him and she goes, and how do you spell happy again? <laughs> so it's just, it's you, you got to stay grounded. You got to stay grounded and <laughs> in, in what, what you really want. Um, because there's some people that never feel like they make enough. So Joe, how do we work with you? How do we work with you so that we can scale and get those systems in place and get that tree in to go from that 1 million to beyond 5 million to go to 10 million? How do we work with you or even to start a second business, right? Because you're a serial entrepreneur and you grow businesses um, just to grow them. So how do we work with you? How do we find you in order to do that? Uh, You guys can go to teachtoscale.com, which is our website. If you'd like to participate in this type of business building in particular, I would go to book a time with me directly, which is teachtoscale.com forward slash catapult. Um, And if you do that, you'll get a chance to talk to me directly. We'll talk about what you want to achieve. I will give you kind of the roadmap on that call for you to go do on your own should you want to. Should you decide that you'd like to work with me, you, of course, have the opportunity if it's a good fit. But for the most part, I want that call to be available to people, regardless of whether or not they're going to work with us. I want them to know they have a place to go to get a real plan instead of just being told, buy more ads, get more leads, close more deals, right? There has to be a maturation of the way we as leaders in the entrepreneurial community deal with folks and how we act as educators first. Um, and that's always my, my first priority is to be there for that. So if you guys are interested in that, you can jump on that call again at teachtoscale.com forward slash catapult. So you guys heard that teachtoscale.com slash forward slash, right? Ca- mm-hmm. Catapult. And right. I'm going to put that in the show notes. Thank you so much, Joe, for joining us today and sharing your amazing goodness and wisdom and leaving us with so many things to think about. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me and for asking what really good questions. Some of them are definitely from angles I don't normally get. So it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks for, for coming here and sharing your knowledge.